Hello and welcome to the big picture. The reforms of the United Nations Security Council has been a subject of much debate for a long time. For years, countries outside the permanent members of the Council have been demanding both reform and expansion. India has been one of the main countries which has been seeking a permanent place in the Security Council. Through the years, however, this demand has remained unfulfilled, even as India has joined three other countries, Brazil, Germany, Japan, known as G4, to demand that they all be included. Last weekend, finally, in what India has called as historic and path-breaking, the UN General Assembly adopted a negotiating text by consensus. This text will be the basis for negotiations after nearly two decades of attempts to come to this stage. What does this significant development mean? How will the negotiations be undertaken according to, according to this text? What are the hurdles still in ensuring that the long-needed reforms will take place? What are the chances of India finally getting a permanent seat in the Security Council? We will discuss all this today with Meera Shankar, former Indian Ambassador to the United States, Commodore retired Uday Bhaskar, Director of Society for Policy Studies, B.S. Prakash, former Ambassador, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, Chairman Center for Canadian, U.S. and Latin American Studies at the JNU, and K.P. Nair, Consulting Editor of the Telegraph. Welcome to all of you. Meera Shankar, how significant is this? It's being called historic, path-breaking. I think it's a significant step forward because till now, the discussions in the UN on Security Council reform have been taking place uh, on the basis of statements by different countries which just reiterate their known positions and without any uh, text on the basis of which to have give and take, to have negotiations because it's just been an iteration and reiteration of known positions in formal statements. Now with this, uh, you have the positions of various countries formally yes. incorporated in a text and that will provide the basis for countries to actually give and take and negotiate. Now, whether this is going to lead to uh, fructification in terms of an actual uh, reform remains to be seen. But I think what happens is that you can have reform either from top down, that is the P5 agree and they push, that is unlikely to happen because the P5 seem to be uh, lukewarm or negative on the question of UNSC reform. It can be a bottoms-up approach where the UNGA and the members of the UNGA push or try to gather two-thirds majority uh, for uh, reform and supplemented by pressure from outside. So I think in this case, it's going to be really bottoms-up. Bottoms-up, the has pressure happened. coming from there. And supplemented by civil society from outside. Okay. Uday Bhaskar, <laughs> you know, very important thing. Three, three countries, three of the P5 countries have not actually contributed to this text. What does it mean? Well, I have China, a slightly... China, um, US and Russia. Russia. You know, I have a slightly different uh, assessment. I would say that this is procedurally significant to the extent that, as Meera said, it has moved from in the vocal domain to something that is now a written, a written text. Domain. But, and there's a big but, substantively, I am of the view that this is well below the median. Mainly because the opposition to any kind of meaningful expansion of the UNSC, along with a veto to those who are admitted, to me seems a very, very low probability. So much so that the United States, even as many countries have been talking about this particular procedural initiative that has been taken, that we have finally moved to a text. The United States has actually gone on record to say that they do not favor the expansion of the United Nations Security Council veto power. I mean, they have tried to put it elliptically, but the core is there that the US is not inclined to have more veto carrying members. Therefore, my personal view is that I think that substantively this is of limited value. I'm not trying to dilute the current saying that this is a fairly major initiative. I'm sure the MEA has worked very hard to get this text onto the table. But the real politic behind this and the fact that apart from the fact that the United States, Russia and China have not contributed to the text, 
one country has gone on record to say they do not want more veto. We have China and Pakistan, which are differently, I think, trying to build a certain opposition about wanting... As far as India is concerned. As far as India is concerned. Uh, about a completely different metric under which the expansion will take place. So I still maintain procedurally, yes, substantively, very, very low. Okay. Uh, Mr. Prakash, would you, would you agree with that? Is this just a procedural thing which has happened uh, and you think that any, any movement can take place? Of course, it has to be voted in the General Assembly and all these procedures are still there. But would you consider this as I, an important I, I step? Would, I would... I would, uh, I would say, I would agree with uh, Uday Bhaskar. It is historic in the sense that there is a long history <laughs> that we have traversed. There was an open-ended working group which was involved in this process for 15 years. And then for the last uh, eight years or so, there was another intergovernmental process. And there was a danger that after all this discussion, sometimes going round and round, the process may wither away. So the positive aspect of this development is that it will keep this neg negotiating process going and it will give a foundation, as my colleague Meera Shankar has explained, it will give it some focus. After all, the President of the General Assembly has done some work. There are diverse and conflicting views in this text. So therefore, while it is a positive development, it is not a definitive development. It is not something that should excite us beyond a point. But I think what should give us some satisfaction is that this process will continue. It has already continued in the new session of the General Assembly. And there were those who were even trying to prevent that. Then the whole thing would have kind of withered away or collapsed in a certain sense. And people would not have allowed even this incremental step which has been taken. So we can derive some satisfaction, but we need not be euphoric. That is not me. be euphoric. Okay. Uh, Professor Mahapatra, uh, this is an incremental step. What is the next step? Uh, I, I don't even see it as an incremental step, <laughs> but it is a momentous uh, change because uh, General Assembly was used and abused in the past by the major powers. Uh, imagine during the Korean War, the Americans knew that the, if the Soviet representative would come to UN Security Council, he would veto. That is why the US took the whole question to the General Assembly, where majority of the members were supportive of the US, and used General Assembly for the Korean War purposes. More recently, because India was not uh, prepared to sign the CTBT, some major powers took the whole CTBT issue into General Assembly and got it rati ratified by that. But this is momentous, I'm saying, because first time, without the involvement of the major powers, and in fact, despite the opposition of three major powers, the General Assembly uh, has you know, passed such a resolution. So this is a change in the very evolution of the United Nations as a process. But the discussion draft that we are talking about, it is not even a set of proposals. Which country takes what position is, re is written down there. So this is actually a new change, a new beginning. But in which way it is going to move is completely uncertain. But we can always say this is a positive step towards that direction, but it's a long, drawn-out struggle that we can expect in times to come. KP, what, what steps, what, what do you think will happen now? Well, uh, the next uh, major e event that is going to happen is in November, when uh, the uh, group that was uh, so far headed by the Jamaican ambassador, Courtney Rattray, will meet again. And I think uh, there will be an effort by countries like India, which view his contribution towards Security Council reform positively, will make sure that uh, he continues as the chair of this uh, uh, particular operation. And uh, that is the first struggle for India. And uh, then, of course, there are very many stages. But to my mind, the most important thing about uh, Monday's debate was uh, not so much that the resolution was unanimously uh, approved, but that uh, countries like Pakistan, you know, the Pakistani permanent representative Maliha Lodi, for instance, uh, ran down the entire process. She said it was flawed. 
the uh, Italian uh, permanent representative criticized it very much. I mean, a few others criticized it. But the important thing is that those who criticized it did not have the guts to call for a division, you know? That, so it, that it, shows, it, it, that shows was, that if there was a division, was they didn't have the numbers. They didn't have the numbers, you know? Uh, eight so years there ago. Was a consensus. Yes, but eight years ago when the process started, uh, countries like India, the group of four which wanted the reform, did not have the numbers, you know. The fact that we have the numbers today and the, that those who oppose Security Council expansion did not dare to call for a division, I think, was the most important aspect of the Monday, okay. of Monday's Would you agree with that, Meena? Well, I think the fact that it was adopted by consensus is important. But it's going to be a, a, a fairly long uh, battle, if I may say no, so. I mean, if you look back and see when the one and only expansion of the Security Council occurred, and that was in the non-permanent category. That was in 1963, when the Asian and African developing countries got the votes in the UN General Assembly to press for expansion in the non-permanent category. Once that happened, the permanent members who were opposing the expansion, even in the non-permanent category, agreed to the expansion. So I see this as part of a process of mobilization, negotiation, and trying to build pressure from below uh, for Security Council reform, along with pressure from the side. Now, if you look at India, then four countries, you know, four permanent members have said they support India's candidature as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, uh, Russia, uh, UK, France, and then last, I think, was the US. Uh, China continues to be ambiguous. ambiguous. Uh, on the whole question of Security Council reform, the US has said it should be based on certain criteria you know, what are the kind of countries you should get, and the ability of the countries to contribute. They say they are not in principle opposed to a small expansion of the UN Security Council. But no country gives up its privilege, you know, privileges without a fight. And as far as the veto is concerned, I think the G4 resolution to which India was a party actually did not seek the veto. We agreed as a compromise to get UK and French support that we would not press for the veto, but we would ask for the whole issue of veto to be reviewed after a certain number of years, 10 years or whatever. So I think the question of veto really, as far as the G4 resolution is concerned, was mm -hmm. set aside. The Africans who couldn't agree on a consensus um, candidate for the G4 proposal um, then hid behind this position that there could be no permanent members without a veto. So I think this issue will come up, but it's not going to be something which is going to happen, you know, in the no, near what, future. What, what is expected to happen uh, in, in this session? There will be negotiations. First of all, it means that discussions will continue in the 70th session of the UN General Assembly. Is there, uh, going, is there is going an open-ended. There is an open-ended working group which is going under the Jamaican PR, which is going to have consultations and negotiations through an intergovernmental process. And as far as India is concerned, we hope that you know we can put pressure to have this, in some sense, uh, so that uh, you know our aim is that in the seventieth year. 70th anniversary of the UN, that we should certainly make progress on this. What kind of progress? Would that? Well, see, as I see it, you know, and, and India, as she was pointing out, all the G4 countries giving up the as far, the veto, uh, you know, the, the veto. You part, know, there are many views on this veto, as she was saying. It's not yet in black and white or binary. But my reading is that it's unlikely that in this particular session that there would be a need for a vote as KP has explained. That particular step, I think, has been crossed. There is a text now in writing which will be circulated in the UN process. My reading is that the more important development will be at the political level, meaning one reads from media reports that it is possible that the leaders of the G4, that is India, 
Brazil, Japan and Germany would perhaps have a meeting on the sidelines of the UNGA. Prime Minister Modi has repeatedly asserted that it would be appropriate if in the 70th year of the UN a meaningful change is brought about. So my sense is that the procedural part having been addressed, and it is important, I'm not trying to dilute that, I think all my other members in the panel have made that point, the real sort of contestation or consensus which must emerge has to be at the political level. And that is where I believe that these four leaders will try and get some degree of support. And each of them has a specific country which is trying to block the so-called admission. Yes. China looms large because China has very strong views about Japan. Japan. Why Japan should not be there. It has used many adjectives to describe Japan's behavior. Ditto as far as India is concerned. And there, there is Ambivalent also... Ambivalent as far as India is concerned. But now the Pakistan sort of support, you know, I think China has been fairly visible in terms of supporting that particular initiative. So this is going to be a very major political issue. Concurrently, it's not as if Germany has got, you know, the consensus of all of Europe. I think one of them mentioned Italy's own role as far yes. as this whole expansion view is concerned. And similarly, Brazil is not without its own regional detractors. So I keep saying that the politics behind the expansion of the UNSE is very tangled. And while, of course, the desirability is not in question, that the UNSC needs to be okay. revamped. That the reality is a bit, to my well, mind, bleak. Pr Prakash, untangling this, untangling this political, process, political realities. You think any such untangling is going to happen if, you yes. know, as we have read, th there may be some kind of a meeting between of the G4, G4 leaders, uh, you know, on the sidelines. You think there some kind of untangling can happen? And as far as the opposition from China, and as far as India is concerned, from Pakistan, and you know, other countries. How, 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 you know, what kind of a scenario do you envisage? No, very, very unlikely. I think if one were to see the, one were to see the complexities of this whole process, we have been talking about the G4 and the G4 leaders, leaders may meet, but that's important. But we should recognize that also the G4 today, each of its countries is somewhat different than when the G4 was formed in 2005. Brazil is undergoing a difficult phase. President Dilma Rousseff has her focus inwards. I was ambassador to Brazil and I know this and that is the reality. Japan has very serious uh, problems with China. Uh, Germany, the Europeans, again, their preoccupations are elsewhere. How much of political energy Germany, which is now dealing with the migration crisis, will spend on this issue is a question mark. One way of looking at it is that of the G4 and also among the developing countries, India has a steady accretion of support. I think uh, already as we have seen among the P5, apart from the ambivalence of China, we have a degree of expression of support from the other four members. In the large group of countries in the United Nations General Assembly, I think our informal understanding is that as many as 130 countries or on record as having shown support for India. I'm not saying that all this will lead to anything. For one thing, let us clearly recognize that can we think realistically of an expansion without any candidate from Africa? Exactly. Africa has not even made up its mind as to in what form they would like to put forward a candidate. So it's a long and tortuous process. I think what we have achieved and we must derive some satisfaction from it, but without uh, losing realism, is that I do not think that an expansion can happen without India. There was a fear many years ago that for budgetary reasons, for financial reasons of the UN, only Germany and Japan will be kind of co-opted. There was this, we forget it today, but there was a view that Japan as the largest of the US, the contributor to the UN, Germany as a country which pays 10% to the UN budget, they will be brought in for burden sharing. And I think India was uh, saw this uh, possibility and we said that how can there be an expansion with only the victors and the vanquished <laughs> in the Second World War now being in the Security Council. It would be absurd. So today we have reached a stage where it, there can be no expansion without developing countries. There can be, I think, no expansion 
without India. But whether there will be expansion, certainly not in the 70th session, I think. Okay. But it's a process in which we should stay engaged. Okay. That's interesting. I, I, in fact, I want the point which you made, that there can't be an expansion as far without India. Is, is, that, is that something which all the countries or all the major powers are, have understood? I think so, because if you take a look, I think there are various factors uh, for this. One is India's scale. You know, over a billion, and also now population. the capacity to capacity to share the burden yes. also, and uh, financial burden. Eventually, going to be the most populous country in the world, a democracy, uh, a developing country, and one which has the ability to contribute to consensus on difficult international issues, where perspectives of developing and developed countries are different because India combines in itself both perspectives to some extent. I mean, we would have the high-tech software sector and we would have people living in abysmal poverty. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a large agricultural economy and at the same time we have very sophisticated space and atomic energy programs. So in a sense, India is the country which can provide that bridge. Which can be the bridge. Okay. Uh, Professor Ma Mahapatra, 130 countries have said yes, you know, we will support you. Even four of the five um, P P5 members keep on giving us this assurance. All this will, will make a difference? Uh, at the moment, yes. But when the real time comes to take the decision, things may change, you never know. The good thing is, not only four uh, uh, permanent members have openly supported India, China has not opposed it openly. Right. That is very meaningful. But I would say that, uh, you know, there is a group of four, there's a group of 25, and there's a group of five. And these three groups have different kind of agenda. The group of four wants that if you are going to expand it, we four are the best candidates. Right. The group of 25 are saying, no, 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 you don't have to expand it, only group of, make it, uh, you know, more, more numbers without any permanent member, any, any new permanent members. And G5 is the status quo power. It is better to, uh, you know, keep it as it is than expand right now. So, in 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 coming time, as in when the debate is going to take place, there are so many things are going to be on the table. On what basis they are going to take a decision whether country A, B, C, D should be a member, a permanent member in the future or not. And is it going to be a financial criteria? Who can pay more? If that is the case, there are many countries which can pay more than India. Is it going to be a military muscle power? then Pakistan will say even we have the muscle power. So exactly the criteria of selecting members is also going to be equally important in coming uh, you know, months and years about this. Okay. In fact, uh, KP Nair, criteria. First, they have to evolve a criteria. Evolving a criteria itself will become a, will be a quite a painful process. Yes, uh, but uh, stemming from that, I want to go back briefly to what you uh, asked about what will happen in the 70th session, yeah, sure. whether it will go through. See, I was, uh, I was going through the uh, text, the so-called text, and I wanted to print it out, you know. But then, days when uh, you are advised not to waste paper uh, for ecological reasons, I found that the so-called text is 144 pages, you know. And, uh, you know, this is not even a rolling text, you know. <laughs> So, first, you actually have to create a working text out of this 144, 144 you know. But having said that, uh, you know, I mean, one never knows. Miracles do happen. So, it is quite, it is quite possible that uh, 70th session may uh, move ahead on that. But then, you know, criteria, I wouldn't del dwell too much on the issue of criteria because, you know, uh, by now we know uh, what are the criteria by and large and everybody has said but that, that, has India, to, that has to be agreed it, it it has to you know well there is broad informal agreement it has to be put down on uh, paper obviously Rwanda doesn't fit the criteria <laughs> right India in India does I also want to make another small point because in our public uh, discussions there is quite a lot of uh, 
stress on the Chinese position, you know. Right. And it is even suggested that China is against uh, India becoming a permanent member. I wouldn't subscribe to that. I would be more suspicious of the United, United States, States, you know. And the Americans have been very clever. China at least put their uh, well, put uh, their, their, their hand on the table, you know, their cards on the table. But the Americans were very clever. They didn't have a statement. In Monday's debate, they didn't take part, you know. So what is the American position, you know? I mean, here we let seem me, to think that because uh, let's, Obama let's, Obama said, uh, made one, one sentence, one uh, the Americans seem to support us. But I don't subscribe to that view. Mira, would you agree with that? Well, I think in 2009, the Obama administration actually debated focusing uh, or giving priority to Security Council reform. But then I think with the divisions on Syria and Libya and... Um, other issues, I think they um, held back. But I think they did progress because earlier they never used to, at least even in a public statement, support India's candidature. They had supported, expressed support at various times for Japan and Germany. And Germany then, after the differences on the Iraq war, I think they had stopped supporting publicly. So there has been a progression in terms of the U.S., initially not supporting India, to actually publicly declaring their support for India. But how much priority they are giving to Security Council reform as a whole <laughs> is a different that question. Is, that, that's, that's an important issue. And uh, um, Uday Bhaskar, so Pakistan, how, how much will Pakistan be a thorn in the India's flesh in, in all this process? I think Pakistan... And how much, how much important role it, will it play if... It has to deny India, you know, which, is, which is what its primary uh, concern is. You know, I think looking at this from Pakistan's perspective, my reading again is that they will leave no stone unturned to either prevent or create obstacles as far as India's admission is concerned. Because if you look at the debate in Pakistan and all the statements that they have made over the years, not just now, ever since, even I remember after the end of the Cold War, when for the first time there was this discussion about what will an expanded or reformed UNSC look like. We're talking about 92, 93, the Clinton period. And the Pakistani debate or discourse always was that India does not qualify. <laughs> we have no view on Japan, we have no particular view on Germany, etc. But India does not qualify. So the spoiler or, let's say, the unifocal kind of thing, which is as true of the UNSC as it is of India's nuclear profile, etc., etc., so to that extent, I would say that Pakistan's responses I, will be just, predictable. Yeah. But okay. can Sorry. I just add one line or wait? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying that I want to add to what uh, KP was saying. At this point, I am still a little sort of skeptical, not just the US and China. I would be a little wary of all the all permanent the members till they actually provide that support in writing. As far as India is concerned, as I said, at the end of the day, I have my own doubts about the G4 getting admission en masse oh. as a block. So I do they not, have to compromise There might there. be some disaggregation, and, some yeah. compromises. Very I think, quickly, Rabina, uh, The out. point that I wanted to make was that Pakistan by itself will really not matter. It is the way China will swing on the issue, which is going to be, uh, you know, sub, which is going to be substantively, uh, which is going to substantively affect the outcome. Um, as far as Pakistan is concerned, it's more isolated today than it, than was. it was in the past. And if you look even at the Arab countries which used to support them, I think there are uh, tensions emerging and so uh, far which, more... So which, which <clears throat> you mean that, you know, it is advantageous to India because of all this. In thing. that and sense, it may not be as, Pakistan's as... ability to play the spoiler, spoiler. to quickly. some extent uh, is reduced. Very to add to that, Girish, uh, Pakistan's fortunes are declining in the General Assembly, you know. Uh, say, five, five years ago, they, had, right. they were part of what is known as the coffee club. They yeah. had 45 yeah. members. Yeah. Yes. Today, it is rechristened as uniting for consensus. Yeah. And right, they have right. only 10 members. Okay. You know? okay, I think on that note, we completed our, our, our time. But interesting, it was an interesting discussion. We'll have to wait and watch what will happen. The UN General Assembly has just begun and will be beginning today. And what will happen in the coming days, we'll wait and watch. And this is something which India has been hoping for years but as all my panelists say, something is, is something which is not going to come up very, very soon. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue on the big picture at the same time tomorrow.